Hello and welcome to this uh, video on advances in external memory technology. And in this video, uh, we're going to cover essentially the topics of how uh, the memory systems have evolved from uh, DDR technology to uh, what we see today, which is HPM, high bandwidth memory and what are the various speeds and some of the trade-offs that um, we can use while doing a design with these memories. So let's start uh, with DDR3 memory. Uh, the DDR3 memory came into use around year 2007 and we can see that it, you know, the speed was around 800 to 1600 mega transfers per second and it used a 1.5 volt reference. Um, when you look at what kind of density it could achieve, um, it was not only using a four gigabit chip, and you could stack those chips to get an eight gigabit chip. Um, so normally you would use, let's say, two ranks and eight um, chips on each rank. Um, and so if you follow the four gigabit, <clears throat> That's 32 uh, gigabits on each rank. If you use eight chips, that's four gigabyte. And if you use just two ranks, that would be eight gigabyte. So a normal uh, chip in DDR3 would have been an eight gigabyte chip, but with double density uh, and dual stack that we're talking about here, dual stack chips would have given you 16 gigabyte max uh, density. So um, then, Around 2014, we see uh, DDR technology evolve to DDR4, and the speeds uh, jumped up quite a bit from uh, 1600 mega transfers to it started above 2400 mega transfers, went all the way up to 4400 mega transfers per second. Uh, the DIMM capacity increased, uh, the density increased to 64 gigabytes, and the reference voltage shrunk to 1.2 volts. Um, and then a year ago in 2020, um, we see the evolution to DDR5. DDR5, again, the speeds go quite a bit higher because the previous one was 4,400. You see it starts at 4,800 and goes up to 6,400 mega transfers per second. The voltage references continue to shrink by just a little bit. So 1.1 volt reference has some features like on the ECC. Uh, to deal with the super fast rates here. Um, but overall, uh, DDR's evolution um, was kind of linear, and then DDR5 is pretty, pretty uh, huge improvement in speeds um, and technology. Um, but, and it's providing uh, huge improvements in, in density as well. But one of the challenges uh, we face using external DDR designs is the PCB technology is complicated. Um, it, it is very much limited by the, uh, the connector standards, which carry 64 pins, um, double data rate pins, but 64 pins. And so that's kind of limiting and the power usage is also a huge limitation in this um, design. So um, AMD started to work on this new technology uh, known as high bandwidth memory, and it worked in conjunction with partners like SK Hynix. Um, the 3D stacking technology that was being developed by Toshiba, Hynix, UMC Amcor, ASC, and AMD all together worked on this technology of develop, developing this high bandwidth memory. And the idea was to use a wide IO memory, um, lots of channels. Um, initially it was, um, I guess, um, maybe it would have been single data rate, um, but we see them as double data rate uh, channels later on. The high bandwidth memory, uh, we see the first chip came out in 2015. It's a GPU with HBM, the original HBM technology in AMD Fiji uh, GPU. And you can see a picture on the right side. You can see uh, the four stacks of 
uh, I believe HBM memory alongside the um, the GPU processor chip. Um, and also NVIDIA came out in the following year with the Tesla P100 chip using the HBM2 technology. Um, and some of this material is courtesy Wikipedia, so you can check it out there as well. So uh, looking further into the evolution on the HBM side, um, you can see this is kind of what the HBM looks like. There is this silicon interposer uh, on top of the package. And the silicon interposer on one side, you have this GPU, CPU, sock die, which was you know supposed to be there. But then you have these um, stacks of memory uh, lying alongside. So let's just look at one of these stacks here. And if you look at a stack, um, it has these 3D vertical technology uh, through silicon vias that connect all these uh, together to a phi um, logical die at the bottom. And then that is connected using the interposer to the phi chip. So this whole system then has this integrated DRAM stacks alongside the phi with no PCB involved, right? This is all just using the interposer mechanism here. And not just the GPU, CPU, but even FPGA vendors and even switch vendors today are beginning to use this technology to bring HPM high bandwidth memory um, closer to their um, ASICs. So um, let's just quickly briefly look at the, um, the speeds and feeds involved here. So the 3D stacks in HPM, you can have um, multiple dies stacked on top of a base die. Uh, we normally see four high stacks, but you can also see eight uh, stacks um, being available. Um, now each stack has two channels um, and each channel is 128 bit. And in this first generation HPM, you know, the, the transfer clock rate was 500 megahertz DDRs would be like a giga transfer per second. Uh, in a four high stack, when you have two 128 bit channels, you get 256 bit per stack times four stacks. So 1024 bit wide IO at one giga transfer per second. And so if you do the math here, one giga transfer per second times 128 bits per channel times two channels times four stacks, that comes out to 128 gigabytes per second. And that's the speed of the first generation um, HBM technology. Moving on to HBM2, you see that the speed on the pin itself, the transfer speed has doubled from uh, one giga transfer to two giga transfer per second. And the number of channels still remains the same, but there's a new concept called pseudo channel. Each 128 bit channel can now be broken into two 64 bit pseudo channels. And if you uh, look at the fact that you have twice the signal, uh, the clock speed, and um, then if we, uh, uh, oops. if we look at the um, total throughput, so at um, two giga transfer per second times 128 bits on each channel times two channels times, let's assume four, four high stack, that's 256 gigabytes per second, which is twice of the first generation HBM. Now we see um, some improvement in some intermediate technology called HBM2E. HBM2E brought the uh, signaling transfer rate to three, around three uh, giga transfers per second, which is not quite double, it's like halfway there. So that was sort of a uh, short uh, lived technology. And then you see HBM3 coming out uh, quickly thereafter that increases the transfer rate quite a bit up to 8.4 giga transfers per second. And the number of channels bit width roughly, I guess, remaining the same. Um, so if you look at that, um, 8.4 giga transfer per second times 128 um, bits times two channels times four high stack, that comes out to uh, 1,075 gigabytes per second which is almost four times the HBM2. So um, 
in a nutshell, we can see that the bandwidth um, has gone um, quite a bit higher from the DDRs. And even though we have now see, see like very high speed D, uh, GDDR6 and GDDR7 technologies coming out, but the advantage of using HBM, one, it's very easy for uh, FPGA developers and, um, and uh, you know, ASIC developers because they don't have to um, build an extra memory outside. Um, the power, the PCB designs are all very simplified. One downside is that there is limited um, DDR available uh, in this configuration. Uh, the density is not that high and uh, that continues to be a problem. However, the because these are ultra wide um, stacks of memories connected to the die, um, the, the clock speeds are slightly lower and they consume less power. So uh, there are reasons to uh, like uh, this HPM technology, but at the same time, there may be some challenges because of density um, and uh, and we might see where it ends up. But for now, lots of um, FPGA vendors like uh, Intel and Xilinx have uh, adopted HBM and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's being, it, it's very popular and it brings a lot of um, high bandwidth uh, memory in the hands of FPGA developers that can uh, use that high bandwidth in 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 ways um, that you know were not possible before, because the extra bandwidth that we have can be used to compensate for the extra latency that is usually there in DDR. Uh, given that technologies like you know reduced latency uh, memories are uh, obsolete, uh, we have to leverage this extra bandwidth that we have in our hands. To, uh, to compensate for the latencies uh, that the DRAM chips have. So that's it for this um, video, guys. And uh, hopefully you got a good overview of what are the various uh, DRAM, HPM technologies, etc., that one can use these days. And if you have any questions or comments, leave me in the section below. If you like the video, then give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I bring topics on the FPGA side um, as well as algorithms. Um, um, and, uh, and if you're interested in these uh, type of topics, do uh, go through my uh, channel and see if you like any, um, any of the series that, that are already available. And if you have um, other topics that you'd like me to bring, um, on my channel, then do leave them also in the comments. So once again, thank you for being here and spending the time with me. Uh, I'll see you in another video later and uh, thanks and bye-bye.